One of the reasons why, uh, we, at least Stockholm Environment Institute, and I believe also Africa Ahead, uh, were interested in holding this this seminar was was to discuss a little bit about the differences between um, the CLTS, the <coughs> community-led total sanitation uh, programs around the world that stop. They're aimed to stop something. They they stop open defecation. Um, that's through naming and shaming and triggering change. Compare that with something like the uh, community-based uh, health health clubs, where you're starting to do something, you're, and you're given options, and you understand, um, and it's a much more positive um, kind of thing. Now, it's a really controversial thing. Uh, UNICEF was invited to participate in the seminar and decided not to. Uh, this week, there are several uh, meetings discussing CLTS. Um, so keep in mind what you've learned today about CHCs and, and um, bring that back to your workplace. As I said earlier, uh, the uh, people here today are, are open for collaboration um, so we can learn together. And I think that's, that's what we've, we've been hearing from George as well. I think as a funder, he's looking for, for things that work. Um, and things will become fashionable and get funded, but in the long run, it's, it's the things that work that will, will be resilient. And so um, we have about uh, almost 20 minutes. And uh, basically, uh, the way it will work is, is you can all line up here, or you can just put your hand up and come to the front, say who you are, what you'd like to ask. You can ask uh, any question that you'd like to any of the speakers. Um, so, um, and you did have these little discussions with um, your neighbor, and that might be something of interest, um, something that may have popped up. Okay, Marianne Shalane from Siwi. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, also thank you for the idea about asking uh, uh, questions or uh, discussing questions so that's where I, I my, it comes from and also thank you all for really nice presentations I think this has been very informative and valuable uh, my question relates to the to the idea of to the approach uh, of the community health clubs and and sort of the also the idea of rolling it out where it sort of has some standardized features in some way and so I'm wondering a little bit how much it changes in the community because there it will meet uh, I mean, there are existing maybe religious associations or uh, welfare associations and, and, and these things like how uh, is it managing to merge with those existing structures or are there like a new power dynamics in the community when you get this sort of new new idea and maybe new people engaged? Uh, so how that is being managed and what is your experience in terms of in maybe different? We're not going to collect uh, questions. I, I particularly don't like that. Okay, uh, thanks, Marin. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really you, know, you have to sort of tailor it to the local situation. You don't want to burden them with all you know, the, an endless extra institutional things and, and and make it life more complicated. So, you know, if there are existing um, w w you know mothers' clubs, women's clubs, I existing structures, then just bolt onto that if you can and make it in, in hard. And I think that's you know th that's how we were discussing it with the, the DRC. Um, provincial people from from their Ministry of Health was how they've already got the structures in place, you know, so, and they don't want to kind of reinvent the whole thing, cr trash what they've already been doing for ages, and, and 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 try something new that maybe works for a bit and then it crashes again. So how we how do we work within the existing structures? So it's very much tailor made to the local situation, but it's um, that uh, that seems to be, that seems to work okay. Um, you know, it it. Um, uh, and in terms of, you know, after the six months, what tends to happen is that the clubs, I think Juliet was referring to it. In fact, if you look at your, um, if you look at your little handouts that we've given, if you see the kind of the, st the stages they reach, they go from, from the initial getting the club started, getting this common unity of purpose that we were talking about, um, and then it leads on. You've got, a, you've got now a, a functioning community that then goes on to the next things that are critical to them. So, you know, they've heard about the importance of, you know, of, of, of um, safe food chain, the safe water chain, and so they take those those sort of projects into their into their orbit. But the overarching thing is poverty, and so you know, obviously, income generating activities is, is very much foremost in their minds. And they, 
and this developing of social capital and social trust kind of um, works in so many ways for, 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 for the mothers to trust their, their young kids so that they can go to the clinic. They've got a neighbor so that they can trust with. That happens with these clubs. So you've got, you, you address this whole sort of um, that side of it. But you've also got, you've developed trust within the community that they see working <coughs> together, you know, we can, we can farm together, we can have corporate farming, those sort of things. And so in whole districts in, in Rwanda, for example, in uh, you, um, Zimbabwe, I mean, the one district had got up to 5,000 beekeepers. They sort of suddenly worked, you know, and then they realized that bees need trees, so then they started planting trees everywhere. So it's kind of this, this whole kind of constructive approach forward, but they work with, with you know, they make they, those decisions are made by the by the people themselves. Long, long-winded response, sir. Yeah, um, one of the uh, strong. I'm very interested in learning, and uh, one of the strongest uh, learning uh, initiators is embarrassment. So the naming and shaming uh, a part of CLTS is so effective because it's a very strong learning uh, thing. That doesn't mean that it needs to be the only thing, but I think it's a very good starting point for bringing change. And uh, what I heard about uh, the community health club sounds very interesting as something that could be combined with such an approach. But I think that knowing how learning works is, is important. And uh, yes, okay, it's always nice and to be good and positive, but again, the strongest um, thing that you remember is when you did something wrong. And you don't want to repeat that, especially with, when other people were seeing that. So that is the, the, uh, the strong part of CLTS, I think. And it's also the thing that you need to... The learning is, is understanding. That's, that's the thing. So I mean, when I was a child, they used, we used to get strapped for, for doing bad things in school. And the question is, is there any learning? Um, the, in, it, will, it will be if, if, there's a, if it's folded up with something positive and, and the content of the CHC is there. Whereas um, the name and shame thing is, is a sensational thing, and it can actually put the learning to the side, park it a little bit too much. But that's, that's the controversy. Uh, Juliet wanted to say something. Please come up. Um, I, just wanted to ask, I just wanted to just throw it out to the floor a bit, because I think we should open this dialogue a bit to everybody. Um, can you all just put up your hands if you're a parent with children? I mean, obviously, if you've got a parent, you... You're going to have children? Okay, so people with children, um, you're going to send them to a school, right? And you're going to look around in the neighborhood. You're going to look around for a school that suits the kind of education that you'd like for your children, right? And you're going to look and you're going to go, okay, so here's a comprehensive school. Um, these kids, uh, when, when they do something wrong, uh, they, they, they're sent home from school. They don't get a second chance. Um, this is an old-fashioned system where if you do something wrong, you stand in the corner or you go and write lines. I don't know if any of you went to school in those times when we actually used to get beaten. We used to get the ruler. I went to school with nuns who used to smack me on my hand with a ruler if I did something wrong. Also, I had to hold up my arms if I did something wrong. I had to stand in the corner if I did something wrong. Those kind, that kind of training for children has gone out of fashion. Do we agree with that? I mean, do any of you want to send your kids to those kind of schools? No? Because the kind of schools now are enlightened schools. They're kind of schools where if you do something, you might get stars, you might get rewards, you might... Um, there's, it's much more to do with incentives to um, make yourself um, appreciate things, to um, encourage people. And we're certainly not allowed to beat our kids, and we're not allowed to embarrass them. We're not allowed to mention the color of their skin or if they're dirty, right? We do not say to the children, you're dirty, you come from a dirty home, go home until you wash. We're not allowed to do that, are we? No. So my question is, if we in public health uh, 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 have a choice between two systems, we're public health pr practitioners, if we have a choice between two systems, should we go for an enlightened system which allows you to let your people learn, your people in your village, say you, you think of your child now, your people in your village, you let the people learn, you let them then be encouraged by sharing to do something together, is that not a positive way to go? And if it achieves the same amount as the punishment or the embarrassment or the shame or the disgust that you use for other triggers, which I totally agree work, I totally agree they work, 
I just think it's not the time for that kind of intervention anymore. I think as practitioners, we've moved into a more benign, and we have to do things in an ethical way. I'm challenging the process that makes people embarrassed, and that's why they should do something. I don't think that should, should work. Not in our day and age. I think we've moved beyond that. I'd love to hear your opinions. But here we are not uh, talking about children that are, being, um, that are being named and shamed. We're talking about adults that are being named, uh, blamed and shamed. So it's, it, it is, it, it's, and it's all, it's all base, based also on information. It starts as an approach with, with, with information. So I, I, I think that you're putting things against each other that, that shouldn't be put against e each other. It is, I think, uh, a mix of the two that could work. I don't see the reason why you should, why you should sort of divide these, these, the, these two approaches. They are not sort of opposing approaches, I think. Yeah, there is some connection. There now we're going to get into the, the heat of it. Um, I, I, I saw three hands, but, I, but you, were, you were talking about um, the photographer before, so I think you have it. Come on up. Yeah. Because you were, you were disturbed by being pictured all, all morning. So please say something about um, what's concerning you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam Bickle with the Evaluation Office in UNICEF. I'm not going to enter into this polemic. Uh, I don't think you're the fairly talking about how cats and CLTS operate. There's a trying to trigger a lot of community pride to take charge of the problems that are identified. So it's a bit of a straw man that, that you've set up. But actually, I had uh, different questions. One is for Mr. Nelson, which I thought was a, just a terrific presentation. Um, I, I think you, I would, I'm not the one that responds just only to anecdotes and stories. I like, do sometimes like to see the statistics. So. Are you running some statistics, statistical tests on the work you're doing? Like when you show the income and the capital spending, are you showing, seeing some statistical significance in that and in some of the other results? And which are the ones that are leaping out as really having a statistical power, really showing impact? And uh, the second question, uh, maybe a little bit out of left field for Ms. Nash, but in talking to Mr. Wolf on the sidelines, he said that you had helped arrange through Notre Dame the uh, uh, bringing of a an evaluation approach to the work in northern Uganda. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about what is being set up there to match. It's not designed as a match, but uh, along with a good one from the Gates is doing with the Africa Head programs. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we run uh, significant tests on, uh, on the gender division of labor. And what I showed there was uh, what we had as significant, what came out significant. That is uh, the fact that men are also involved in cleaning in the Ekosan households or the UD households. And then also in Kabale, we, we, we did a significant test there, but it wasn't very significant. But then we could see from the trends that uh, men are also involved at least more than they are in uh, the pit latrine households. For the costs, we, uh, you know, getting cost data at the household level is a little bit challenging in uh, rural Africa. So we, we had a uh, estimates and we use the median value to be able to, to take care of outliers because we had some outliers. Some households actually reported quite high amounts of uh, money that they spend on their toilets. <coughs> then we used uh, a medium absolute deviation to be able to present uh, what I showed. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the randomized control trial that we've just started about the program H2O Plus. It's specifically focused on the clean cook stove aspect of it. So within the 75 communities, we've divided or, or Notre Dame has divided it uh, randomly into communities that will actually be able to get access to the clean cook stoves and communities that don't. And then we will be measuring both at the, the chief cooker of the household, which is typically the woman, uh, and the entire household, what is the impact of having the clean cook stove introduced or not? So the, the chief cooker, in this case the women, will actually have a device <clears throat> attached to them for 24 hours to measure the level of CO2 in, you know, in the household as well as with them, uh, and then to see how that tracks over time. That will be done at certain preordained periods. Uh, and then measure that against what the levels are in communities that don't have the clean cook stoves. And then we will add to that 
data that we're going to be collecting from the local health clinics as to what's happening with just families in the communities because the clinics happen to, they don't just serve, an, serve a particular community, they serve communities all over. So we'll be getting their data, whatever they have, to say how does what's happening in a very controlled environment compare with what's happening in a community that has nothing, that then compares with what the clinics are getting from a much broader uh, variety. So um, while the, the RCT in the will be most classic in terms of the ones that have the clean cook stoves and the ones that don't, we also want to overlay the information of what the clinics are getting and see can we make any connection. Um, we may be able to, we may not be able to. But uh, yeah, Dan, is there anything that you would want to add to that? No? And I would love to talk to you about you know, how you're doing your studies and see what we can learn from that. Thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you for that question, too. Um, please. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Louise Moll. I'm a sanitation and hy hygiene advisor with UNICEF. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a, I feel I have to make a little bit of a response about the comments that have been made about our programs. Um, we have just undertaken a global evaluation of our CATS programming, which includes CLTS, as well as school-led sanitation and other total sanitation approaches. And overall, the findings um, are very positive about the impact that that's having. In 53 countries world, around the world, millions of people who are now living in open defecation-free communities because of this approach. And I think anybody who's been to see the approach implemented at a community level would not see it as a naming and shaming event. I mean, when you take something to scale to the extent that we have across 53 countries, often national level programs, you get bad examples. There are always occasionally poor quality programs. And that's something that the evaluation helps us identify and something then we try to follow up and address. But I think on the whole, uh, CLTS and other community type approaches really do try to take an empowerment approach when they're engaging with the community. One thing that we've found, and I mean, I think it's very interesting, George's comment, that when the community engages in that, reaches open defecation free status, often you have then created a, a space in which to have further ongoing discussions about other hygiene and health issues. And a number of our programs are taking that opportunity, setting up wash committees which then have a broader health and wa wash uh, <coughs> mandate. Um, because we as an organization have a multi-sector approach, some of our health and nutrition colleagues are very excited about the opportunities that the kind of community cohesion that has been created at the community level is something in a platform that they can then go and build on. So um, that's my response. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Is there anyone that would like to say something about the CLTS or CHC models? Um, your left and then uh, the, my name is Kamran. I come from Pakistan. I work with UNICEF, but uh, I have a very knowledgeable colleague from the government of Pakistan. Um, once we started with the presentation of Benin, uh, uh, we were very interested because it looked quite similar to uh, the programs we have. UNICEF has its programs, and then we have other sector partners, and then we have uh, donor-funded programs. Now, we came across this debate of shaming, no shaming, pride and dignity uh, some four years ago, after we had big floods in 2010, and we were starting a very large-scale program. <laughs> and uh, as uh, my other colleague has said that uh, CATS community approaches to total sanitation includes different approaches. So uh, what we found the right recipe for Pakistan was to uh, put them in sequence and in synergy so that we can um, start the learning process with the community through wash clubs in schools uh, and then but there is a power in triggering through CLTS using the Gamal Kars method. That's uh, output oriented, that's quick, 
that's at scale. Um, I, I had a question also that this can be done by the government itself because it's so simple. So we, we took one of the provincial government to trigger the communities themselves, while the other approach is uh, through wash club in schools, sanitation marketing has its own marketing methodologies to mobilize people. Uh, and uh, there are other institutions that we were talking about, the mosque, for example, in Muslim uh, areas. Uh, there are community organizations. So once we are working for a change and for development, it has to be an all-encompassing approach. We cannot use any one of these approach and think of development. Even we had to cross-cut with uh, other programs like education, and uh, so that's my humble. That's excellent. Uh, that's good to hear about this. Um, there was some there's a man there. Yeah, put your hand up. Please come up. We, we're running uh, at 2.30, 12.30 now. I think we can take a couple more questions after this. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Orlando Hernandez, and I'm affiliated with the uh, Wash Plus project funded by USAID. And I was just interested in finding out from the CLTX experience in Benin. We do have a program in Benin, but in the urban areas. Um, can you address the sustainability issues in Benin, um, and perhaps also the minimum standards associated with the types of latrines that are being constructed in uh, the CLTX program? Um, well, there's no particular um, latrine that is being uh, standardized in the in the program. So, as far as I know, um, that's that's not uh, that's not there. Um, and the other question was. Uh, I think that was the sustainability yeah. part of it. Sorry. Uh, the sustainability part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, one of the one of the big the big problems that you have when you talk about about uh, uh, sanitation is that in fact you are trying to influence uh, a system within a system because you're trying to influence households and you want people to invest themselves to do something. I mean, government is not checking, at least not in Benin, uh, the quality of the toilets. Uh, in the Netherlands they do, but in in Benin they don't. And so you, 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 you are trying to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to bring people to, to do that investment rather than invest in a mobile phone or a scooter or whatever and, 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 and use, their, or use their own labor for creating something. That's what you try. So you're, you're, um, the, the, um, as I said, our, our program uh, as we run it at the moment in, in Benin is, uh, is the bilateral program is, is a, uh, uh, an, a start to sectoral support, so it's really very much a, um, a principal agent problem. Yeah, you, you, you know maybe how you want to do things, but you're not doing it. It's the government that's doing it. Uh, they are the ones. And then the government is doing something, and then you have to talk about central government, who are in their, in their turn influencing local government, and local government is trying to bring people to build toilets in their houses. So it's... it's, 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 it's um, in terms of, of achieving that is, is quite a difficult system to influence. And that's why this, this CLTS, where you bring people up to speed about the consequences of, of uh, hygienic behavior is so important because it, it declicks the, 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 their, their willingness to, to invest in, uh, in, uh, in, in sanitation in their own household. This sustainability part that we, uh, and that's where in particular my colleagues that are supporting the UNICEF program, uh, that they introduced is that they say, well, how in this uncertainty you are still, how can you create some certainty? And the certainty that they then were looking for was uh, an agreement with the Benin government that they would push for the, the, the community health workers to, uh, the, the governmental community health workers, to, uh, to follow up when there has been a CLTS intervention. So the, the, it, it, it is, it, it's, it's commitments that you are in fact uh, um, uh, contractualizing there, or trying to contractualize, 
and um, uh, probably that's the best thing you can do. It's it's you're trying to to bring people at least to realize that just doing this uh, this triggering is not enough. You need to have sub subsequent uh, intervention. What we have in our program also, and that's that is um, maybe to uh, to increase the uh, the likelihood of people really doing something is uh, a microfinance part where you make sure that there is when you do want to have something you, you as a household you can also take a risk you can invest in a uh, in a in a latrine uh, using uh, a microfinance uh, credit so that those are sort of the, the elements that that should secure to some extent this um, um, sustainability but it comes to a whole society or a whole community starting to think differently and that's what you trigger with with the first intervention <coughs> so we have one final question uh, before we break uh, for lunch Hi. Um, thank you uh, just uh, sort of to the panel the first question what, what are the life cycles of uh, you know some of these programs um, that are run I mean, uh, I've seen, I've heard talk of many different and diverse projects in various areas. So, I mean, are, are they one year, two years? And some of the challenges which uh, threaten their sustainability. And the second question was to Lisa Nash. Um, in terms of um, the collaboration that you have within the various <laughs> providers, uh, do, do you guys have a benchmarking system? I, I know perhaps this is a bit of an idealistic question considering the diversity of challenges around the world, but is there some sort of benchmark? And I, and I ask this question purely from a sustainable point of view. Thank you. Do you want to do that one first? Sure. So yes, we all want the magic bullet. Um, you know, what we've focused on with our members is saying in terms of, of the monitoring and evaluation post-implementation, they obviously have to decide what are the metrics that they, they monitor that's most important to them. But we ask for three, uh, generally, and they can customize them. The first one is whatever the system is, whether it's a water system or sanitation, is it working or not? Just the basic. Is the water flowing? Is the toilet you know, still functioning? Number two, how many people is it serving? Because if you've got some idea about the level of people, you know whether it's, if only two people are using it, there's something the matter with it. If 500 people more are using it than you expect, then it's probably just too taxed and you've got to do something else about it. And then the third area, which is really squishy soft, uh, but which seems to be getting the most interest among the members, and we're still figuring out is whatever what's your number one quality measurement so for our member in west bengal in india it's what's the arsenic level in the water because that's the one thing that's going to kill everybody for somebody else it may be you know the level of community activity in you know making sure that the one pit two pit latrines still function and they they really are used because that's what it, clearing it out is what's going to make it sustainable so whatever that one one you know, statistic is standardize it, say that's what I'm going to track, and then we ask them to, to track it and share it on the network. So we're still learning. Um, and I, anybody got any great ideas, please let me know. And, and then you asked about longevity, is that right? Uh, our programs uh, started in the, in the early 90s, so we've been there for 20 years in Bena. Uh, the current program that, uh, that I'm responsible for started in 2007. Uh, it is currently running until the end of 2015, but we are going to make an extension until 2018. So we're talking about an 11-year period of running that. And I, I, the implicit message is you should be have a long-term engagement in order to really bring change. And I think that's that's true, but you need to think together also. So you need to sort of continuously see whether your intervention logic, which is what we're talking about all the time, is 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 really the most uh, the most effective one. When it comes to monitoring, I think uh, this introduction of this ACFO system is very interesting because, again, it allows a, a municipality uh, who should be responsible and, and feel responsible for something to, to track what they're doing. But not only can they track what they're doing, they can also prove to others that they're tracking what they're doing. And that makes them an actor, not just to central government, but even to outsiders. 
because they can show, look, if you want to invest in my place, I can show you the results because I can create uh, uh, credible proof uh, that your money has been used properly. So it's, it, it, it's with the coming of, of internet, uh, you have a, a number of tools that are very interesting. Uh, and these guys, they're here uh, at, uh, at, at, uh, at Stockholm also, I think. That, that is, I think, a very, very promising system to, to, have, uh, to have available, that you, you emancipate local governments to become a trustworthy actor by allowing them to have an information channel uh, that others can follow also. Okay, I, I'm going to uh, round up this, this session here and I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, I think uh, we kind of resolved a little bit of that controversy between CLTS and CHCs. There was a, a um, there isn't really a, a controversy. I think in fact it's, there's, a, there's a lot of complementarity. We're, the interesting thing is that this is all about um, human beings. And so when we talk about integrating things, um, like the, this thing about um, IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, which was like with us for the last 20 years, it's really, the real integration is with the human with the, with the, and the groups. And the humans work, need to work in groups. And I think so, uh, to change uh, behavior, and this is not just a, an African problem, I think it's a global one. You know, concerning hygiene and things related to it, um, we need to learn from each other, and we need to integrate about the different forces around us. So, um, I think uh, you'll be hearing more about these these two two or three different kinds of approaches <laughs> and how, how we organize ourselves and how we learn from each other. Um, so, uh, you will see uh, that some of these themes will be recurring during the week. And um, it's, it's a very nice thing to have a meeting on Sunday like this because then you'll see each other during, during the week um, and you'll know where, where you've, you've, um, you've seen that person and you have something to talk about. So again, that, that little group uh, function, uh, you now have it with you. Um, so I do thank you for coming and um, have a good lunch and we'll, we'll see you during the week.